Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today in the U.S. we celebrate Memorial Day, a day when we remember those men and women who gave up their life to defend and to protect our beautiful country. It's a good thing and it's a right thing to honor those who have given their lives in the service of our country. For his part, God himself in today's gospel reminds us that there's also another country to which we ought to dedicate ourselves, the heavenly homeland. And it is in this sense that the faithful Catholic really does have a dual citizenship. We are citizens of the United States and citizens of heaven at the same time. There's no problem, of course, with having a dual citizenship, being loyal to our earthly country and being loyal to our heavenly country and our heavenly Father at the same time. Just as long as our earthly country does not ask us to violate the laws of God. When our country does ask us to violate God's laws, we must say no. And just because something is legal, of course, according to civil law, doesn't mean that it's legal in God's eyes. This includes not only abortion, but also things like same-sex marriage, legalizing marijuana, euthanasia, birth control, contraception, pornography, sexual activity outside of marriage, witchcraft, human cloning. All of these are abominations in God's sight, and they are serious sins. So we as Catholics, and even more broadly as Christians, cannot embrace or endorse these sins. So even though Memorial Day, on this day we rightly honor and call to mind those who have died in service of our country, it's also beneficial to call to mind those things which cause us to die spiritually and to be excluded from our heavenly country. Now today in St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, we see a man coming up to Jesus and asking him what he needs to do to gain citizenship into that heavenly country. He says this, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Mark 10, 17. Now it's actually the best question really that anyone could ask. The only problem is, is that the young man didn't know to whom he was addressing the question. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Mark 10, 18. Now remember that Jesus that when Jesus had asked his disciples the question, who do men say that I am, only Simon Peter gave the correct response, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. Now in the encounter that we have before us today, Jesus is not eager to reveal his true identity to the young man who calls him simply good teacher. So he reminds the man that only God is good and that only God can truly tell us what we, have to be, what we have to do to be saved and to inherit eternal life. But why doesn't Jesus just tell him, well, I am God, I am the Son of God? Well, Jesus knows that there's something holding this young man back. Jesus did not entrust himself to everyone during his earthly ministry. And St. John in his gospel tells us as much. At the end of chapter 2, he says this, When Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. John 2, verses 23 and 25. So even though Jesus did not want to immediately reveal his true identity to this young man, he does, however, answer his question. Jesus essentially says this, If you want to enter into eternal life, obey God's commandments. And Jesus mentions specifically the commandments that have to do with loving and respecting our neighbor. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Remember that St. John again tells us in one of his letters, those who say, I love God, and yet hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother and sister who they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. 
1 John 4, verse 20. Now, the commandments which deal with how we love others are indicators of our love or our lack of love for God. So that's the first thing that Jesus puts before the table in dealing with this young man. He needs to make sure that he's treating others the way God wants us to treat others. And how does the young man respond? Well, basically, he tells Jesus, I've passed the test. Ever since I was little, I've treated others as God's told me to treat them. And that's the part of the discussion which, in a certain way, turns back to the original difficulty about Jesus' identity. The gospel at this point, why, says this, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Mark 10, verse 21. Now, just in the third, just as in the third chapter of Mark's gospel, Jesus had looked on the Pharisees and on the Herodians with anger and was grieved at their hardness of heart. Mark 3, verse 5. Here, Jesus looks on this young man with love. Why? Because he knows that this young man is telling the truth. And he was pleased with the young man's faithfulness to the commandments. But then our Lord points out something to this rich young man which he had probably never thought of in his life. Jesus says this, You are lacking in one thing. Go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Mark 10, verse 21. Now what's Jesus doing here? Well, he's inviting this young man to detach himself from his earthly possessions, not only to have his heart not overly attached to what he owns, which all of us must do. We all have to not be excessively attached to earthly goods. But Jesus is telling the young man that if he wants to love God with an undivided heart, he should sell his possessions, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow Jesus. This is a subtle, almost indirect way of Jesus revealing to this good young man that he, yes, is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Why? Because only God is worth abandoning everything in order to possess him. Now, does everyone have to give away everything in order to be a true follower of Christ? Well, no. Go and sell what you have and give the money to the poor is not a command. It's an invitation. It's what's called a counsel, not a precept. A precept, for example, is that every faithful Catholic has to assist at the Mass at Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligation. It's obligatory for all who follow Christ. A counsel, on the other hand, would be to assist at the sacrifice of the Mass also during the weekdays, if you're able to. You don't have to, but it's counsel. It's a good counsel to follow if you can do it. Now, in St. Matthew's version of this encounter between Jesus and the young man, He tells us that Jesus added something to the conversation. He said to the young man this, If you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor. Then come and follow me. Matthew 19, verse 21. Jesus is essentially presenting to this young man a better, more perfect way to love God and to love his neighbor. Voluntary poverty is what's called one of the three evangelical councils along with chastity and obedience. When Jesus presented this more perfect way to St. Anthony of the desert, St. Anthony jumped at the opportunity. He really did sell everything he had. He gave his money to the poor, and he followed Christ into the Egyptian desert, into the solitude. Same thing with St. Francis of Assisi. He gave all of his riches back to his father and began begging for his food and living totally for God. And many other religious have done the same as well. Now, in truth, there's really no more beautiful choice than to leave everything and give away everything for the love of God. As St. John Vianney, the cure of ours, once said, he said, I have not, I, he says, I have met plenty of people who have repented at not having loved God. Never have I met one who repented of having loved him. But this rich young man in the gospel would not accept Jesus' invitation. At that statement, the gospel says, his face fell and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Mark 10, verse 22. And perhaps here we see why Jesus was not ready to reveal his divinity 
his divine identity to this rich young man because the young man loved his possessions and his life too much. His allegiance was more to his earthly home than it was to his heavenly home. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life, says the Lord. John 12, verse 25. Earthly riches, remember, are not evil in and of themselves, but God's richness is not found in them. God's richness is found where? Well, it's found in giving, in poverty, in prayer, in solitude in taking the last place, in humility, in a contrite heart, in serving others, in being persecuted, despised, and rejected for the love of the gospel and for the love of Jesus and Mary. That's where God's richness is found in this world. And Jesus, even today, still calls souls to follow him more closely, to abandon everything, and to serve his church as religious or as priests. And so we ask, in our materially rich but spiritually poor and spiritually blind Western culture, is there anyone willing to still answer Jesus' call? 